know, sometimes God gives you a home and, you know, it was our home when our kids were there and our kids all grew up and they left and, and uh, sometimes it's empty. But you know what? God knows how to fill it. And we thank God for the privilege that we've had. And uh, we just want to be a blessing in our lives. That's what we want to be, is a blessing. You know, sometimes through, through growth comes pain. Through growth comes, sometimes we don't always understand every action we have to take, every direction. But God does. You know, when God asks you to be a blessing, bless, because you receive more than you give. And uh, we just want to thank God for the church, for you people. And my desire is to be a blessing to you as you are to us. But for us to be able to grow together. And if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to Revelations, the first chapter. And I want to read the first three verses. Because this is an avenue of which I see Jesus. I know John is on the Isle of Patmos. I know that John is reading uh, is writing down what God is telling him, things that must shortly come to pass. But when I challenge the church, I want us to grow spiritually. I want us to become overcomers. I want the church to be able to be a strong witness in our communities. When I read this first three verses this, this week, I want us to speak to us because I want you to come to maturity. I don't want you to be not knowing the Word of God, but I want you to come to a maturity of the Word of God. And I know that, again, John is writing what Jesus is laying out, those things must, which must shortly come to pass. But I want to lay out to you that I believe that he's also reading that we, the church, need to open up our Bibles and we need to read it. I got the privilege a couple of weeks ago to uh, share in the teen class. And one of the questions that I asked the teen class was, how many of you read your Bibles? And every one of them said, not me. I don't read my Bibles. And I thought about that and I thought, what about life? We're out here struggling. Our nation is struggling. Our world is struggling to find life. And God has given it to us right here. Oh, but I want to try this. How's that working for you? I find loneliness, I find discouragement, I find suicide, I feel, find avenues of things that are going to take away, that's going to separate, but I find life in Jesus. And I know I'm not a big emotional person since my heart attack, I've cried more since my heart attack than, than I've ever probably cried in my life. It changed my emotions a little bit. But you know what? When I get into the Word of God, it changes my life. And I want it to change your life as well. So let's read here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to, his, to show His servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels, his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God. And to this testimony of Jesus Christ to all things 
that he saw. And notice what he says here. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. Blessed is he. That word blessed means happy. Where there's sadness, it needs to be happy. Happy is he who reads the word. Happy is he who begins to understand what God is trying to say to us. John here is writing about a time of horrible things that are happening, are going to happen. I don't believe we're in the tribulation yet, but I believe that we're very close to that kind of tribulation. But we are in tribulation. Every one of us have things that are being, uh, that we're being, they're giving tribulation to us. They're giving us a hard time. There is that kind of tribulation, but it's not the kind of tribulation that we're going to have. As Matt was teaching Sunday school this morning, and those things that are going to come up on the earth, when those bold judgments are passed out, when those different judgments are coming, there are going to be things that are going to be horrible things that are going to come. We haven't seen anything yet. COVID was nothing to what's going to be. But you know what? You and I better get ready. Youth, you better get ready. What did Jesus basically do? Last week, we talked about the church at Ephesus. Boy, what a good church it was. Paul said, I get excited about coming to Ephesus because what's happening in Ephesus? But when he got there and, and, and when, when John the Re began to write in the book of Revelation, what happened? You lost your first love. How much today has a church lost its first love? I'm tired. It's just not interesting. It's boring. You know what? There's nothing boring with Jesus if you want to make it that way. Unless you make it that way. Because He is alive. He is living. He is real. And we can experience that. but not if we don't read it. Point number one here this morning. We need to read. Blessed is he that reads. And he's talking about this book. When you read Revelations, most of us say, oh no, Revelations, I'm going to shut my Bible. I'm not going to read it. I don't want to know. But we do that with most all the Bible. I don't know what about, about sin. I don't want to know those things that are going to separate me from God. Oh, but I'm a Christian. If we're Christians, why are we living like hell? Yeah. I'm sorry. Not sorry. We live like hell. And expect God to bless us. Our churches are empty. Well, we might catch COVID if we come to church. You know what? More people are catching COVID because they've taken the shot. More people are catching COVID because they're wearing masks. If you look at the statistics, oh, but you can't look at the statistics. We tell you so. <clears throat> you know what? Jesus tells us, these things shall not come upon you if you're doing what I ask you to do. Oh, Pastor, you've lost your rocker this week, haven't you? Yeah, I probably have. But God is calling the church to repent. Stop walking in the sin that so easily besets us. You know what? I get tired of people lying to me. What do you think God does? 
You know, you can lie to me and get away with it. But you can't lie to God and get away with it. Because you know what? You can't get away from yourself. We need to repent. He told the church, Oh, you're doing this and this and this and this and this is right. But I have somewhat against you. You look at what he wrote in the seven churches there. I've got this against you. You love the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What did the Nicolaitans do? They promoted prostitution. They promoted promiscuity. They promoted idol worship. They promoted all these different things. God said, you walked away from your first love. Have you walked away from your first love? What takes a place of God in your life? We need to repent and come back. What do you say? Come back and do your first works over again. What happened to you when you truly repented? Now, I've seen a lot of people come to an altar, and I've seen a lot of people pray a sinner's prayer. And they still go back out and live the same old way that they did before. God said, you're going you're to be a change that's going to take place. The Holy Spirit's going to begin to challenge your life. The Holy Spirit's going to begin to work in your life. And things are going to begin to change. But when there's no change, I wonder if there's any repentance. We can all do it for show. We can all walk to an altar. We can all say a sinner's prayer. But true repentance means we're sorry for. What did Jesus tell the woman taken in prostitution? In adultery. Don't you sit here and criticize somebody else because you're probably doing the same thing in your own heart, in your own life. But what did he look at her? He said, go your way. Sin no more. Don't continue to do it. Repent. I ought to hear some out ends, but you know what? We have conditioned ourselves that it's okay. I see judgment in God's Word. I see judgments in God's Word. We need to repent of our sin. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for us and that we can change our lives. And also we need to confess Jesus Christ with our lips. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that if we confess Jesus with our lips, that he is faithful, he is just to forgive us. That's John 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. There's cleansing that needs to go on in the church. We need to read the Word of God. Be challenged by this Word. When John began to write this, he was challenging. God was challenging the church. He's challenging us today. Open your Bibles. Get them out there. Begin to read them. The second thing he did, study. Know what he's saying. How does the Spirit of God speak to you? How does God speak to you? What happens if your boss gives you an order? An order? Hey, I want this done. I'll be back in an hour to check on you. If you're not willing to do it, and you tell him, what's he probably going to say? You're fired. Study God's Word. We find here that in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we are to study God's Word. Why? Let me turn there and read it to you.
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness that the man of God may be completely and thoroughly equipped unto all good work. Why are we to read it? I don't know about you, but there's some things that needs to be changed in my life, and I need to read God's Word to know what they are. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict me, but if I don't do anything with it, it takes an action on your part. You know, that boss can tell you what to do. You know what? He's already paid the bill. But if you decide not to do it, see, we have, this, we have this bad thing that's happening now is we don't follow instructions, but we get paid anyhow. If you've ever sit in the boss's position, he gets chewed on, he gets cursed out. You ever been a boss? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know what? Jesus has given us some instructions. And there's going to come a payday. But God's word is there to correct us. To instruct us. He doesn't want your Christian life to be a boring, dull life. He wants it to be exciting, full of joy, full of peace. Most of us are running because we have no peace. You know, I, I've sit in services and I've watched people grab the, when you give it the altar call, I've watched people grab the back of the pew or the back of the chair until their knuckles turn white because the Holy Spirit's convicting them so bad, but they won't surrender. They won't give in to what God is saying. And we can do that same thing. You know what? God loves you too much to let you stay there. That's why the Holy Spirit continues to challenge you and try to correct you and try to give you instructions and try to give you hope. He wants you to know there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. He wants you to know that you can have peace instead of being torn apart inside all the time. He wants you to know that there's victory over the habits that we have that destroy our walk and our relationships. We need to read the Word. We need to study the Word. The third thing we need to do, we need to be doers of the Word. Don't just read it. Don't just study it and find out what we're supposed to be doing. But be doers of the Word. James tells us that. Become doers of the Word. Don't read it and then forget what manner of person you are. You know, God gives us instructions. Church, we have nobody to blame but us. Hello? When we have 60 empty chairs here, we have nobody to blame but us. Jesus said, go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in. When's the last time any of us have invited somebody to church? I'm looking at me. You know, those fingers don't all go that way. Four of them are pointing back right here. When's the last time I invited somebody to church? I have invited people to church, but, but the thing is, when's the last time that God gave you the ability or the opportunity that we've taken? Oh, I was proud of my wife yesterday. We was at a store. And this lady was at the store and she had three little children. And oh my. She was dressed in an improper manner. 
You know what my first thing came out of my wife's mouth was? I'm praying for her. Something has happened in her life that she needs prayer for. She not only in her own life was experiencing something, but she was teaching her little children to dress that way was proper. And it's not. It wasn't. But you know what? There's tragedies in life out here. When we look at psychology, psychology sometimes wants to give us all the answers, but they don't want to look at the, the very problem. Why is it problem? What happens? Folks, every one of us have gone through something in our life. You know what? Some of us have victory. Some of us don't. But you know what? God's Word tells us what the answer is. Will we apply it? Or will we sit back and judge somebody else? You know, the mission of the church, we're going to bring them from all kinds of different avenues of highways, byways, hedges. When they all come into the church, they're not going to be perfect. But you know what? We're here. We're to be God's hands extended to them. I love you, brothers. I love you, sisters. I love you. Jesus didn't make the distinction. He wrapped his arms around everyone. Every one of us have fought something or been somewhere or done something. You know what? God's house is a place for teaching, training, loving, equipping, helping, ministering. The world does enough judging out there. We can't judge. Oh, we can have a standard. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. We have a standard. That standard's right here. And we need to bring people into that standard. But just as when you got saved, you had to do some adjustments. When other people get saved, we have to allow them room for adjustments. Doesn't mean we have to compromise. But we have to raise that standard. And you know why many of us compromise? Because we're not holding the standard ourselves. We're not living to the standard ourselves. Become, read the Word of God, study the Word of God, and then be doers of the Word of God. What are you doing? What are we doing? Are we being the example of what true believing believers are? Hey, you know what? The standard of life may change. Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. His standard doesn't change. He judged sin yesterday, he judges sin today, and he will judge sin tomorrow. And it doesn't change. He gave victory yesterday, he'll give victory today, and he'll give victory tomorrow. He doesn't change. He gives grace today, yesterday, he'll give grace today, He'll give grace tomorrow. He doesn't change. But you know what? He calls us to fall in line with His Word. I don't know about you, but when I think I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and every one of us will, you know, I know what I've done in my life. I've done the good, the bad, and the ugly. But you know what? When I came to that place of repentance, Father, I place it in your hands. Every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you don't have to stay there. You get to choose 
what are you going to do? You may have walked to an altar and are still living in the same old sin. Get it right. Do your first works over again. Church, we need to be out in the world ministering the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He is coming back. And some of us who are sitting and saying, oh, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, Jesus said in his word, not all that say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody is sitting here. If you're not willing to repent, then maybe saying, Lord, Lord, with your mouth, but your hearts may be far from him. I don't want to take that chance or that opportunity to miss what God's doing. Church, let's come to a maturity. God will bring us into perfection if we allow him to do that. Let's pray. Father, your word you said, blessed is he that readeth. He that heareth. He that understandeth. Father, when we see the judgments that are yet to come, we know, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that God, you do love us. But you will correct us. And so, Father, here this morning, as we look at our own hearts and our own lives, we ask the Holy Spirit to touch our lives. Lord, I can't tell everybody what sin is for them. Because, Lord, I have to look at my own life. Where am I falling short? What am I doing? What am I watching? What am I participating in? And Father, I'm so thankful that your Holy Spirit deals with me. So I'm asking you, Father, here this morning, as every one of us are honest before you, that, Lord, you will touch their lives where they're at. Lord, that you will speak to them in their situation. You will touch them and say, my son or my daughter, hey, why don't you come a little closer? Let's begin to understand that there's areas that you may need victory over. Because I don't want you to walk with guilt or shame. But I want you to walk with joy of the power and the presence of Jesus. And then when the Holy Spirit begins to, when you begin to pray and you begin to ask God to forgive you. Lord, help us to shine forth. Help us to show forth that which you've already done in our lives. And we can be that bright shining light to that one that's sitting in darkness and looking for light. We can be that bright shining light for that one who is strayed. That lighthouse that may be a beacon that shines a light and they can begin to find their way back. Because Lord, maybe somebody's been hurt in church. Hurt by an experience. Somebody didn't live up to what they were supposed to be. Lord, you can draw us into that closer walk, closer relationship. But as we begin to repent, Lord, let it come from our hearts. Not just from our mind, but from our hearts. When we do it from a mind, yes, Lord, I've done the right thing. 
but we've done it from our hearts. It changes everything. So Father, if there's anyone here this morning that needs to make that step, help them to do it. Help them to say, Lord, here I am. I come before you. I acknowledge my transgression. As the psalmist David said, Lord, I acknowledge my transgression before you. And I thank you for touching me. If you're here and you're doing that, let Jesus completely do the job that he wants to do to bring you into that point of perfection, that place of grace.